Good evening, everyone. I'm glad to see you all here and fellowshipping. And <laughs> We're going to go ahead and pray and worship our God together. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you so much that we get to be here with each other and that we get to be here in your midst. And thank you that we... We get to glorify you in this time. We get to praise you. We get to enter into your courts with thanksgiving. And we are satisfied. God, we give you this time. And um, we fix our eyes on you. In Jesus' name, amen. i 
Just sit here all the day through. Could I just sit here leaning into you to feel your heart beat? Ooh, and breathe as you. Wonder before me. 
strong The water's deep My heart is heavy And my mind won't sleep Oh, can you heal My fear it breathes I need to know if you're the shadow I can see I want to run to you When the waves break through I want to run to you And not turn back There's no turning back Nothing in the past My eyes are on you can't see nothing at all but your outstretched arms help me believe it though I falter you got me walking on water the ocean sing the song of grace but if I'm Still afraid. I want to run to you when the waves break through. I want to run to you and not turn back. There's no turning back, nothing in the past. My eyes are on you again. Can't see nothing else. Halfway in the grave and then I looked up and saw your face again You pulled me out of the water Water, water There's no turning back Nothing in the past My eyes are on you again I can't see nothing
King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. I will adore you. Yeah. Clothed in rainbows. Clothed in rainbows. Father, we do adore you. We thank you that you invite us to draw near right now. And what you offer is yourself, that we might know you, that we might see you for who you are and all of your beauty and goodness to us that we might be brought to a place of worship and surrender and to just be fully, completely satisfied in you, in your presence. We thank you that uh, you are with us, that you'll never leave us nor forsake us, and that your heart goes out to us in our trouble, in our distress, in our faltering. Lord, you draw near. We thank you that you lift us. I pray tonight you'd lift our, our heads, our eyes up toward heaven, that we might see where our help comes from. Strengthen us by your Spirit, Apply your word to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, why don't you stand up, say hi to somebody. Uh, yeah, something like that. All right. Well, great to be with you guys. Uh, Dominic, Pastor Dominic was here uh, last week, and um, you have a treat because next week he'll be here as well. Um, I'll be doing a wedding, so I won't be able to join you guys. And then the following week, um, Pastor Tony, who is uh, Pastor Sam's little brother, he'll be here. Yeah. And uh, I think rumor has it he'll be leading worship too. Um, so that'll be a lot of fun. So uh, then I'll be back with you guys. Um, so three weeks from tonight. So um, to let's see other announcements um, tomorrow, uh, Sunday, we're having our services as usual, nine and 11. Um, but both services will be inside. So for the month of May, uh, we're going to be inside. Uh, we're going to evaluate that as a, a leadership team and see how that goes. Um, so inside both services, nine and 11. And uh, children's ministry currently being offered at the 11 a.m. service only. So we're working towards opening up uh, children's ministry at all of our services. But for now, um, that's what we're able to do. So um, without further ado, we're going to be in the book of Hebrews tonight. Hebrews chapter 4, 
the Word of God. That's the title of the message. Hebrews chapter 4, the Word of God. So real quick, Hebrews chapter 3 and 4, we've seen an exhortation to faith, to believe God, to believe his promises. And the examples uh, given there in Hebrews 3 and 4 um, of unbelief um, are from Numbers 13 and 14, where the children of Israel, if you're familiar with the story, were led uh, out of Egypt through the Red Sea, through the wilderness. God brought them to the Jordan River, and all they had to do was enter in to that land. They had to believe God at his word, believe his promises. This is the land that God had promised to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob, and now it was time to take possession of it. But the children of Israel at that time did not believe. They did not take God at his word. And in essence, they were calling God a liar. And therefore, uh, they were just doomed to go around and round in circles in the wilderness for 40 years. So that's an example of unbelief. And the author of Hebrews is telling you and me, don't follow in their example, but believe God, trust him. And what comes with faith is rest. Enjoying God, enjoying his promises, walking with him in fellowship, Rest comes along with that. Now, verses 13 and 14, that's all we'll look at tonight. Uh, excuse me, 12 and 13. Uh, we're told why. Why is it that we can take God at his word? We're going to look at two reasons. Number one, the nature of God's word. And number two, the nature of God himself. So let's take a look at him. Hebrews chapter 4 Verse 12, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. The nature of God's word. Let's look at verse 12 a little bit more in depth. Number one, a few things we want to take a look at. What is the nature of God's word? Well, first we see, and very obviously, it is God's word. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Another translation will say all scripture is breathed out by God himself. It comes from God. It has the authority of God. And we'll look at that more in depth in just a moment. But all scripture Genesis to Revelation, it's God's word, breathed out by him. Second Peter chapter 1 tells us that um, no prophecy is of a private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man. The, the scriptures is not a product of, of human invention. Somebody didn't say, oh, I've got some good ideas, I'm going to write them down. This is not the wisdom of man or the philosophies of man, but men, holy men of God, spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 through 21. Holy men spoke. It was recorded for us as they were moved, carried along by the Spirit of God. And so we have recorded for us the very word of God. All that the prophets said, all that the apostles said, finds its origin in God. And so we can be confident tonight as we approach the scripture that it is indeed God's word. 
So what does this mean for you and for me tonight? Number one, this means that it has authority. It has authority over your life, over my life. On all matters that pertain to your soul, to where you will spend eternity, the greatest, most weighty, heavy matters that concern you, they're spoken of here in God's word. It has authority over areas of how your sin can be forgiven, how you can be restored in your relationship with God. This, the scriptures answer authoritatively. It has authority over your life in the way that you live, the way that you conduct yourself, your, your morals, your relationships with other people, with your husband, with your wife, with your children, with your neighbors, with your boss, with the government. With all people, the word of God speaks authoritatively on how you're to live and how you're to treat people on all matters of morality, of human sexuality, of marriage. God's word speaks to it clearly and authoritatively, and we do not need man's ideas or our best thought on the matter. What we need to know in any given area of your life, if you have a question tonight about what you should do, which way you should turn, how you should respond in a given situation, God's word speaks and it speaks authoritatively. Secondly, the fact that this is God's word means that it is not only authoritative, but sufficient. We do not need anything else. God has spoken to us and he has provided for us all things that pertain to to life and godliness. How to live your life and how to be godly. And God's word is sufficient. It is what we need. We don't need to turn to any other source. It is a pure bubbling spring of pure water, able to satisfy, able to enlighten, able to refresh. We do not need the ideas or philosophies or wisdom of men, of humankind. I quoted earlier 2 Timothy 3.16 that says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And verse 17 of that uh, same section says this, that the man of God, that the woman of God may be, notice, complete. Thoroughly equipped, not lacking anything. Thoroughly equipped for every good work. If there's a good work to be done in your life, guess where the equipping for that good work comes from? God's word. If you're lacking in any way in character, if you're lacking in any way in your life, in, in matters of spirituality, if you're feeling empty, incomplete, God's word is sufficient to meet that need. That we may be complete, lacking nothing, and thoroughly equipped, equipped with everything, every tool for every good work. This is the sufficiency of God's word, and it is God's prescription for your soul tonight. Are you broken? Are you hurting? Are you lacking? Are you in need tonight? The Lord is here to speak, and he has spoken in his word to you. It is a mine. God's word is like a rich mine a storehouse of, of treasure. I've been listening to the Psalms recently, and uh, I was just telling Jared before we started worship, I'm like, Man, I feel like it's the first time I've, I've gone through the Psalms before. <laughs> because 
God is just showing me different things, revealing different things to me, highlighting different things. Psalms, I'm thinking, wow, have I never heard this before? This is so good. This is so rich. This is what I need. Oh, God's word, it's authoritative. It is sufficient. Notice back in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God, notice, it's not just the word of God, but it is also living. God's word is living. What does that mean? That it endures. God's word endures from one generation to the next. What God has spoken to people thousands of years ago speaks to us tonight, right now. It's living. 1 Peter chapter 1 echoes the same thought. Let me read it to you. It says, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through what? How have we been born again? Through the word of God. Notice, which lives and abides forever. The word of God, it is living. It is abiding it is enduring, and it is through God's word that we are born again. God's word is living, and it brings spiritual life. It causes spiritual life to be born in you. Jesus said, unless a man be born again, he will by no means enter the kingdom of God. That's what he said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. And unless we allow the word of God to penetrate our hearts like a seed planted in soil and to allow it to bring forth fruit, unless that takes place, we are dead in our sin and trespasses. The word of God, it is living, it endures. First Peter goes on to say that all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man is as the flower of the grass. The grass withers and its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. It endures forever. Now this is the word by which, excuse me, now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. The grass withers, the flower fades. Uh, not that long ago, I love to spend time in Upper Park. It is a jewel. It is something that's so restorative to me. Uh, not that long ago, if you went up to Upper Park, you know what you would have seen? Green grass and wildflowers. Went on a walk with my family, and we just counted, I don't know how many different varieties of wildflower. It was, it was great. We had Grace taking pictures of them. And uh, it's just gorgeous, beautiful up there. But you know, if you go up there now, <laughs> it is quickly turning brown. And uh, just wait till June, July, when it's 185 degrees outside. <laughs> what will you see up there, right? It'd just be brown grass. The, the, and, and what is it compared to? What is that brown grass compared to? You and me, all flesh, humanity. All that we can produce, all that we can make, all the glory of man, it's as grass. It's like a flower. Oh, there's something there, sure. You know, but it, it quickly soon withers and fades away. All the great accomplishments that are sourced in men, in women, they soon wither and fade and are forgotten. But God's word will never fail. It will never fade. It endures forever. Jesus said, for assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot, not one tittle, will by no means pass from the law till all is Fulfilled. When Jesus talks about a jot or a tittle, he's talking about like periods and commas, like the smallest little dots that are in 
the Hebrew um, you know, alphabet and lettering. Not one of those things is going to fade away. Heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word will endure forever. So it is living. And it's living because it also dynamically applies to your life. The word of God, it's not a book that you read. It's a book that reads you. <laughs> it knows you. Open up the scriptures. How many times have, have you been reading in God's word and all of a sudden, not literally, but metaphorically, something's like glowing on the page at you. Something's like highlighted, neon. All of a sudden, you're thinking to yourself, have I ever, like I mentioned earlier in the book of Psalms, have I ever read this verse before? Because right now, it is alive and it is speaking to me. It's speaking right to this situation. It's what I needed to hear. The word of God, it's living. It's dynamic as it applies to your life. Back to Hebrews chapter 4. It is, the word of God is living and it is powerful. It's powerful. It has spiritual power. And that word power in the Greek is uh, energes, is where we get energy from, the English word energy. What does this mean? But that the word of God is at work and it is effective for what it was intended to accomplish. It is effective. It is able to do what God sends it to do. Now, when Paul was writing to the Thessalonians, he had this to say. He was thanking God for them. He says, for this reason, we also thank God without ceasing. Why did, why did Paul just continually thank God for the Thessalonian church? He says this, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, Paul came, he was preaching, sharing the gospel. He says, when you heard the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it. You opened up your heart to it. You received it, not as the word of men. Not just another passing idea. Not just something you read in a magazine or a book from Barnes & Noble. <laughs> no, you didn't receive it that way. Not as, I should say like, you download it from Amazon now, huh? It's like, <laughs> who buys a book from a bookstore anymore? Right? You just get everything from Amazon. No, you didn't receive it that way. But as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. The, the word of God, which effectively works in you. It is at work and effective in your life. God's word has spiritual energy, not just to bring life, but also to sustain your life, to effectively work in you. It has a transformative power to change you. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, its ideas, its philosophies, its wisdom, do not allow the world to shape your thinking, but instead be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. How is our mind renewed? How is our mind changed? How is our mind shaped? By understanding the mind of God, which is revealed in his holy scripture. It's what we need. It's what we need tonight. We need to be transformed. It has spiritual energy, spiritual power. It is living and it is powerful. It is active. Notice how else it goes on to talk about the power of God's word. For the word of God is living and powerful. Notice it's sharper than any two-edged sword. That word sharper there is more cutting. In other words, it, it penetrates deeper than any sword. Than any sword that was forged by, by the hand of man. It's sharper. It's more penetrating. It cuts deeper. That's the power of God. It 
like a sword. It pierces to the core of who you are. Now think about this. A sword is a weapon, and it's dangerous. It's dangerous to your flesh. <laughs> God's word. Be careful. It's dangerous, right? I mean, and I say that in the sense of, hey, when you enter into a relationship with God, you're no longer the one in charge of your life. You surrender. Say, Lord, you have my life. I'm going to follow you. And that might cost something. That could be dangerous to your flesh, and, and I dare say it will. It will. There's a cost involved with that, but oh, it's so wonderful to walk with God, to follow God, to deny the flesh, to say no to self, to allow God's word to cut and divide and pierce you. And sometimes that's painful. Sometimes that's humbling. Sometimes that hurts, but it's a good kind of hurt. God's word is like a sword. It pierces to the core. It's sharp. And like a sword, it divides. It discerns. It opens you up and reveals what's going on inside. The thoughts and intents of the heart are what's going on inside of you. The word of God is able to discern, is able to understand like an x-ray or a CAT scan or an exploratory you know, surgery. God's word goes in deep, but it goes in to the parts where we can't see, but only God can. And it addresses the deepest and broken parts of who you are, our hurts, our pain, our suffering, our secret sins. It pierces down to that. But rather, like a sword that brings death, the word of God as a sword, it brings life. Like a surgeon's knife, God's word cuts and opens up and brings cleansing and healing to us and to our lives. God's word is powerful. God's word is, is active. And he wants tonight for you to just open yourself up to him. Lord, here is my life. I'm on the operating table, as it were. Just have your way in me. Do what you will. That is really the idea behind what we're talking about tonight. Is that you would see God and see his word and say, yes, I believe the Lord. I believe his word. I trust him. And I give him the authority in my life. I give all that I am to him. Lord, take your place. Your word, it's authoritative in my life. Your word, it's sufficient for me. I don't need anything else. And all the power that I need to accomplish what you've called me to do, it's, it's found in you and trusting in your promises. All the life that I need, it's found in your living word as your Holy Spirit works. This is where we need to come to tonight. We need to come to that place of faith and trust, surrender. Now, we've seen the nature of God's word. Verse 12, the, the word of God, it's living, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's piercing to the division of the soul and the spirit of the joints and the, the marrow, and it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. But now, verse 13, we see the nature of God. Now, much could be said about the nature of God, but here in verse 13, we see something very specific about the Lord, and that is he is omniscient. That means he's all-knowing. He knows everything. Notice verse 13, and there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of whom, 
uh, to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. God, number one, is all-knowing. He sees everything. No creature is hidden from his sight. He knows every hair on your head. And for some of you, that's easier than others, right? Sorry, I'm not looking at you. I'm sorry. He sees and knows everything. He knows every breath you take. Nothing hidden from him. God sees your actions. But more than that, he knows your thoughts. He has perfect knowledge of you. He can read you like a book instantaneously. Now, I want to take a moment, and you can turn over with me, if you will, to Psalm 139. I want to read at length from this psalm, so that's why I encourage you to turn over to Psalm 139. I'm going to read about the first 18 verses of this. Why? Because it is the perfect explanation of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13, at least this aspect of it, and the fact that God sees everything and knows everything about you. Psalm 139 I love that sound, by the way. <laughs> psalm 139, starting in verse 1, For the chief musician, a psalm of David. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down, and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You have hedged me behind and before, and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Verse 7, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide me from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb, and I will praise you. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. How precious are your thoughts to me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand of the sea. When I awake, I am still with you. We'll stop there. God knows you. God saw you being formed in your mother's womb. He knows every day that you will have on this earth. All of your days are like written down in a book already before even one of them occurred. God knew it all. He's seen every breath you've taken. From the moment you came into existence, God has been aware of you. In your worst moments, in your best, on your best days, God has seen you. And we are fully known by him. There is no hiding from God. Now, that could either be an incredibly comforting thought or incredibly scary for some of us, you don't know the Lord. That could be a scary thought. 
There's no running. You can ask Jonah. You can run, but you cannot hide. <laughs> the Lord sees and the Lord knows. Nothing hidden from his sight. But on the other hand, as a Christian, I can take great comfort in that because I am fully known. He sees right down into the core of who I am. Fully known and yet fully loved. Now, I, I think that's incredible. Because if God just said, oh, yeah, you know, I love you, and, um, but I don't really know anything about you, that would be superficial. If somebody just says, oh, I, I love you, and you're like, yeah, if you really knew me, you wouldn't love me. <laughs> oh, no, I love you. Well, okay. What if I told you something about me that, you know, whatever, you know, could scare you away? That would be a superficial kind of love. On the other hand, if, if somebody fully knew you, I mean, if I fully knew you, or you fully knew me, chances are we'd want to have nothing to do with each other. <laughs> Think, oh my gosh, you're a creep. Get away from me. <laughs> you're gross. You know, because your brand of sin is different than my brand of sin. You know, what you like, I don't, you know. But see, with God, not only are we fully known, but also fully loved. And therefore, his love for you is not a superficial kind of love, but it's real. It's deep. It's intense. You are fully known and fully loved by the Lord. There's no creature hidden from his sight. We're back in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. But all things are naked and open to him. Now, the second aspect, not only is God omniscient, fully knowing, but he's also our judge. And again, that could either be a very scary thought or a very comforting thought. It all depends on your relationship with God. And, and if you've been dozing off, this would be a great time to wake up. <laughs> Which is okay. No judgment here, okay? But listen, God is the perfect judge. And every person who has ever existed will stand before God and give account for his or her life. And there will be no defense attorneys there. We all know where they will be. Just kidding. Just kidding. That was a joke. That was a joke. Okay. Sorry, I couldn't help it. Lawyer joke. Now, defense attorneys will be there too, but they won't be in the defense. There will be no defense. Why? Because God knows everything. There would be no need for a trial uh, in our courts if the judge knew everything. There would be no ability to defend yourself if the judge knew everything. And that is how it will be on Judgment Day when we all stand before God. And every secret thought, every motivation, everything you thought you got away with, it will all be there as, as plain to see as, as you're seeing right now. And every mouth will be stopped. There will be no way to, to give a defense. Oh, well, I didn't mean that or I didn't. Oh, God knows. <laughs> no use. Don't try to defend yourself. In a sense, that's what it's talking about here. All things are naked. In a sense, not to be too vulgar or whatever, but to stand naked before God. Totally exposed. And what I mean by that is all your life, all your thoughts, every hidden thing. Now, for those outside of Christ, that must be one of the most terrifying thoughts. Because when, it, when it's all said and done, there will be no way to say, well, no, I don't deserve this or I don't deserve that. No, no person will enter, will leave God's judgment disagreeing with the judgment. God is the perfect judge. That's what Abraham said. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? And the answer to that question is, yes, he will. 
all of us will stand before him. The perfect judge, the all-knowing judge, but also this, the all-loving judge. His judgment is not harsh or heavy-handed or, or, or flying off the handle. No, perfect justice. The perfect accountant. Every wrong that's been done will be accounted for at that time. Now, here's the thing. If you're outside of Christ, the wrong that you have done, that will be your punishment. You'll be judged for your sin. And if you're honest with yourself, you know you're guilty. If you look at the holiness and righteousness of God, just look at the Ten Commandments. Number one, don't have any other gods before me. Do you love anything more than you love God? If the answer is, yeah, I, I love my this more than I love God, well, then you're an idolater. Boom, first one right there. You didn't get too far. First of the Ten Commandments. Have you ever lied before? Even a small white lie? You're a liar. Have you ever committed adultery? Guess what? Jesus said, if you look upon a woman and lust after her, you've committed adultery in your heart. You're an adulterer. Right? Have you ever coveted something, wanted something that somebody else has? You wanted it for your own because you were envious of them? You're a coveter. Be honest. Be, be open because there will come a day when you stand before God and you have to give account for those things. Better to do it now. Better to be honest. Level up with God. Allow his penetrating word to penetrate your heart right now and say, God, I'm open before you. Yes, I'm guilty. I acknowledge it. I'm not going to try to defend myself or shift the blame because there will come a day when none of that will fly. So I better just level up now. Here's the thing. There is a way. For all of the wrong that we've done, that we're guilty of, to be forgiven, washed clean, there is a way that we will be able to pass through the the burning judgment of God, and be able to come out on the other side. And what is that way? Jesus Christ. He has paid the penalty for every sin. When he was on the cross, he absorbed the wrath of God for every wrong that you've ever done. That punishment, it was poured out on Jesus. He took your place in judgment. And for every believer on that judgment day, there will be a defense... Jesus Christ, our great advocate, that's what he's called in 1 John. He is our advocate. He is our mediator. He is our high priest, as we'll see, Lord willing, next, uh, next time we're together. We'll see this great high priest who, who interposes himself, who stands between us and God and offers himself as a defense and says, I've paid for that. That sin is washed clean. And we will be robed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. A righteousness that does not come from our own doing, but by faith in Christ and what he's done for us. That, brothers and sisters, is what the gospel is. That Jesus has paid the price for our sin upon the cross. And that by faith, trusting in his work and not trusting in our own, we are justified. That is declared not guilty in God's sight. Now, that is good news, but it will only benefit you if you believe God's promise. A promise, as we talked about last time we were together, a promise is only good if you believe it. A promise does nothing to you if you just say, oh, yeah, that sounds nice, but, you know, what else? I'm, I'm interested in something else. The promises that God gave to the children of Israel about the land, the promised land, it did not benefit them. Why? Because it was not mixed with faith. That's what we see earlier on in the, of chapter 4. Will you believe God? Will you believe his word? Will you trust him? That is a question that all of us must answer tonight whether you have never given your life to the Lord 
or you have, but you're in a new place, a new season where God is calling you over to cross a river into uncharted territory, into land where there's giants and difficulties and hardships, will you trust the Lord? Follow him in faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your promises. Lord, we want to build our life tonight upon the solid rock of your word. We trust you. We believe you. And we thank you that you see us, you know us perfectly, and you love us, and you demonstrated your love, not through just words on a, uh, in a card or something. You, you demonstrated your love by sending your son to die for us and to make a way that we might have a relationship with you. Jesus, you said, Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass. But there was no other way. And there is no other name given among men by which we must be saved. It is the name of Jesus. And it's at that name that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Who here tonight for the first time wants to say, yes, I bow my knee. I give my life to the Lord. I confess Jesus as my Christ, my Messiah, my Savior. I am guilty of sin, and I need forgiveness. Is there anyone here tonight? Simply raise your hand as an acknowledgement. It's not the raising of the hand that saves you, but it's the calling on the name of the Lord Jesus that saves you. All who call upon his name will be saved. Is there anyone here tonight? who wants to acknowledge Jesus Christ for the first time, simply raise your hand. Father in heaven, we thank you. We trust you. We trust your word. Give us faith. Help us, Lord, to, to walk with you. Lord, bring cleansing in our lives. Lord, you know the cleansing I need. You know the cleansing we need to be washed and renewed, refreshed in you. Restore your people. Lord, draw us near to you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's all stand together. Should nothing of our efforts stand, no legacy survive unless the Lord does raise the house in vain, its builders strive to you who boast tomorrow's gain. Tell me, what is your It vanishes at dawn, all glory be to Christ, all glory be to Christ our King, all glory be to Christ, His rule and reign will ever sing, all glory be to Christ, His will done his kingdom come on earth as is above who is himself our daily bread praise him the lord of love let living water satisfy the thirsty without price we'll take a cup of kindness, yet all glory be to Christ. All glory be to Christ, our King. All glory be to Christ. His rule and reign will ever sing. All glory be to Christ. Yeah.
God shall live with us and be a steadfast life, and we shall ever His people be. All glory be to Christ. All glory be to Christ, our King. Christ our King, all glory be to Christ, His rule and reign will ever sing, all glory be to Christ. Thank you all for joining us, worshiping with us. Feel free to come down and pray or talk some more with us.